Hello, and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to our show. We're going to be sharing with you all this week some questions and stories you guys have sent in, which is always something Denise and I love to do with our listeners. So if you're able to just sit back, pour yourself a cup of coffee or tea and pretend you're around the table with us. Okay, I'll start with our first email, Denise. Sounds good. It says, my friend's husband passed in December after a heart transplant. He was my friend too, and I'm heartbroken. He was just such a good human, and his death was a surprise. As a nurse, I know that heart transplants are incredibly risky, but I'm still shocked and at a loss. On New Year's Eve, I was in bed before the ball dropped. I had to work early the next day. I woke up in my normal routine and drove to work. It wasn't until I was already driving that I recalled the stream in its entirety all at once, and I immediately had a very harrowing feeling. In my dream, my friend who had passed and I were standing in an open field. It was very dark, but I could see him clearly, khaki shirts, flip-flops, graphic tee, Buddy Holly glasses, but most of all, I could hear his distinct raspy voice. He reached into his pocket and pulled out two stars in his palm. They looked like Pistina stars, and he moved his hand to show or almost hand me the stars. He was indicating that one of the stars was me, even though he didn't say it. He said, it's time to go, but Polly is going to be okay. That's his partner. And then he threw the pair of stars upwards into the dark and the whole sky lit up with the stars. And that's all I remember. When I recalled this dream while driving, it was like a flash all at once. I immediately got the feeling that my friend was trying to tell me that I'm going to die soon. I'm not afraid to die or anything, but I'd kind of be rather surprised. Now I feel like one of those cartoon characters walking around with an anvil or baby grand piano hanging over my head. Did I miss something? Do you two agree? Okay, I look forward to hearing your input, Denise, but I wholeheartedly disagree with her. I think that her friend was showing her the stars to say, I will always watch over all of you. I'll always love you all. When it's your time, when it's my partner's time, I'm going to be there. And one day we are all going to be on the other side, lighting up the sky and helping others as we continue on. Oh, I love that. And I agree with you. I don't think it was a a precursor to passing or a premonition or any kind of dark inference at all. And the fact, you know, it was in the, it's in the palm of your hand because the the fact that the stars were put in the palm of her hand, you have to wonder if this, this person is, is making a decision or working through something. And dreams for me always come through with very clear symbols, metaphors, that type of thing. I don't get the, uh, like I've walked, uh, they're not lucid there. I have to figure them out like a puzzle. So that really popped out at me. And also the fact that he threw the stars upwards into the dark and the whole sky lit up. It just felt like a a dream of hope and keep looking at the stars, know that there's more, know that you're that connected, that I'll keep in touch. It really feels like a very positive dream. Yeah, me too. That's how I interpret it as well. And you're right. It could be a message that her time to shine is coming. Yes, yes. But I think that palm of the hand is something to think about in the dream as well. I agree. Oh, very cool. Our next one comes from a longtime listener who just had a light bulb go off about something that might be a fun topic. As an empath, we tend to make plenty of time for others versus time for ourselves, right? Yeah, right. But I just had an experience with a coworker where I helped her understand something and literally felt a zing of something that made me feel really good almost like helping people could be a, like a drug or addiction for us. I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Maybe I'm out in left field, but I couldn't ignore the possibility of that correlation. I agree with this person wholeheartedly. That is the beautiful part of being a, a true empath is we do love to give. We love, to, and not in a, I'm going to save the world kind of way, but when you do something unexpected that someone isn't, there's no, they, they don't have a handout. They're not waiting for you to save them. They're not waiting for a rescue. They're just, when you do something from the kindness of your heart, I think that's one of the most beautiful feelings in the world. 
Oh, I do too. I mean, and even, it doesn't have to be a person. I mean, if you help a turtle cross the road or you lift a bee who's stumbling with, with, what, with wings and you help them get back on their feet, all of those things give us a little dose of serotonin, right? It always makes yes. us feel happy and good and connected. And, and I do agree. That's the beauty of being an empath. I think what we're always talking about is don't forget to shine that beautiful helping hand on yourself as much as you share it with others. Right. And I do think the fact that it's a lot of times, don't you find when it's spontaneous helping, you get a bigger thing? Yes, that's the best. I agree. That's the best. Okay. Our next one says, I wanted to share my stories of dream visitations with you. I have always had very vivid dreams, which I usually remember when I wake up. Well, 2020 was a terrible year for all of us. My mother passed away unexpectedly in July of that year. Ten weeks after our mother died, dad followed her. Two days after his death, he came to see me in a dream. I couldn't see him, but he spoke to me loud and clear as if we were on the phone. He said, your mother and I are together traveling through Europe and we're having a great time. I told my sister about this, and a few days later, she said that her boyfriend had also had the same dream after dad died. Her boyfriend is very sensitive, like a 10 out of 10 on the intuitive scale. Recently, I've been doing a lot of art as part of my therapy to deal with my grief. I've been making a lot of resin art, and the other night, my mom came to me in a dream again. I didn't see her, but I heard her loud and clear. She asked me to make her a flowery resin bookmark. She was an avid reader when she was alive. Wow. I think it is so awful to lose two parents you love that close within each other. But if you flip that, there's such beauty there too. I mean, these two people who spent their whole adult lives together, it's almost like they couldn't live without each other, you know? And and so they're together now. And to have confirmation of that in in a dream experience like this, which I do not believe is a dream. I think it's a, a visitation is just such a wonderful gift to know that her parents are together. They're traveling throughout Europe and seeing places and having a great time. They're also able to watch over her and what she's doing in this artwork and able to participate in that by asking for a bookmark. I mean, I just think that's fantastic. I agree. With so much heartache and grief, it is a beautiful validation for this, for this listener. It is a great testimony to love. Yes. Our next one, for the last four or five years, I've seen 11s and 44s constantly. It started with just 11s, and then the number 44 came into play. I've learned that this is God's angels letting me know that they're always with me, guiding and protecting me. We were in Missouri a few years ago to watch my oldest son graduate from boot camp. I hadn't seen him in six months and was just beside myself with excitement. Also, he was graduating on my 40th birthday. Best birthday gift ever. The night we were staying there, there just happened to be an F5 tornado. I intuitively woke up a few minutes before the siren went off around 1 a.m. People were running down the hallway, carrying crying children. It was like a scene from a movie. My fiance and I got up as everyone was congregating by the elevator shaft. There was a television playing in the lobby, and I could see that the tornado was over Fort Leonard Wood, where my son was. My younger son was a few towns over with his dad. I was shaking all over, one of the scariest moments of my life. My fiancé just happened to turn on his phone and saw 211. I instantly knew that everything was going to be okay, and thankfully it was. Also, I was recently watching a Spider-Man movie with my teenage son. There was some violence on the screen and my mind just went to a fearful place. I felt a nudge to look at my phone and it was 511. And right as I saw it, Spider said, everything will be okay. I knew it was God's angels telling me to get out of my fear and that all is good in my world. I'm so grateful for this connection. Sometimes I have dreams that I'm fighting demons or removing them from people in Jesus's name. I've been picking up on a medium that I know having something very dark attached to him. I recently had a dream that I ran into him at a department store while I was looking at silver skulls. We said hi to each other and he kept walking. I felt called to find him and help him. I tried talking to him and he was very uncomfortable. 
I was telling him that something dark was attached, but he didn't want to hear it. I put my hands on his back and could feel the dark force. I just kept repeating Jesus's name and the demon was slowly detaching from him. I could feel how strong this force was and I woke up as the demon was almost fully out. As I was coming to, I had tingles all over my body. I wasn't scared when I woke, but in awe, like I'd done something good. I've also had dreams of fighting demons with Archangel Michael. I feel on some level, this is a calling for me. After Reiki level one, about five years ago, I'd gotten scratched with unexplained X's on my body. I could feel something dark attached to me previously to this scary event. I reached out to Denise for advice and thankfully was able to get rid of it. I could have could feel the second it lifted from me. I'm grateful that for this experience because it gave me the wisdom to know that those dark entities truly exist and that we need to stay close to God for protection. There's a lot in this. And obviously this person is very tuned into a lot of different frequencies to put it mildly. I love the validation of the 11s coming through to let our listener know they're not alone in what they're facing and that there always is support from spirit. And it feels that the religious connection and and again, support is the best word, are helping incredibly in, in all of these things, the tornado, the dreams, the, the day-to-day life. But what would be your perspective on the dream? You have an incredibly vast knowledge with dreams and demons and that kind of stuff. What, what's your take on that? Well, I feel like maybe this listener is dealing with a lot of fears, both known and unknown within her. And I think often when we dream about fighting demons, it's an aspect of fighting the demon of fear that lives within us. And so I think that seeing and tuning into the synchronicity of these numbers is helping her overcome this internal fear. Well, that's, that's beautiful. What do you think? I agree. I agree. And I think the, the connection of feeling that it's a calling and maybe something to explore because you're, you're aligning with uh, specific religious figures and energies. And that may be how you're going to best work with spirit. Yeah, could be. Okay. Our next one says, is it possible to make a post or a podcast on simple crystal grids to help heal our world as it is in the state today? Maybe a meditation for the earth as well, other than the heart meditation. I've never made a grid aside from my crystals and doorways in that. I feel really called to make one for the earth. Any tips besides quartz or rose quartz and possibly the best spot in the house for it? I have a lot of crystals, but not enough pieces for a massive grid. For example, I don't have 10 pieces of quartz, but I would like to try and help this situation. Okay, so I think that's a great question. And something that's important to recognize with grids is that you don't have to have 10 crystals. You don't have to have certain specific crystals. You can use rocks or pebbles that you find on your walk in the woods or in your own backyard or walking by a creek or a beach. So it doesn't have to be, you know, oh, you have to go out and get, uh, you know, a master crystal or a a smoky quartz. You can use whatever your heart is called to, because really what a crystal grid is all about is aligning your intentions with a physical action and a representation and calling on this this co-union with you and the energies of the earth to create this intention in reality. So it all starts with your intention. I just want to say that a very simple grid to help the earth is a square grid where you just have four crystals in the four uh, direction points around a, a larger center crystal. And I think if you're going to do it for earth, then any crystals you find within or on the earth, any stones, shells, or crystals are going to work for this. Something I like to do if I'm setting up a grid for the earth is use crystals that look like the earth. So like azurite, azurite with malachite, chrysocolla, chrysoprase is also a good one. Crystals that have that dark blue and green color in them that just make us think of the earth to me work really, really well. But again, you don't have to go out and buy those you can use what you have. And I also think it's a nice idea to then set up that grid and charge it. You can charge it simply with your finger. You just visualize light coming through your crown chakra, going into your head and spilling down your arms out into your, your, 
index finger, and then you just connect all the points of that grid by running your finger from the northern crystal to the center crystal, back to the northern crystal, and then over to the east crystal, back to the center crystal, back to the east, down to the south, and, and so on, until you have connected all of those crystals with your energy and that center crystal with the intent of your light and universal light force energy. I also like to put a candle next to the grid to keep the light going. Now, where you put this in your home, I don't think that's going to be super important. I think it's nice to have a grid in a place where you can see it every day. So you're reminded to light that candle or charge it up with your finger so that you can be cognizant of saying prayers for the earth's healing. So a kitchen would work well for that. The family room, even the front hallway will work well for that. Again, it's really all about your intention. You can also set it up on, on a balcony or a deck if you want to really connect with the earth energies as well. So I hope that's helpful to you. It's incredibly helpful information. And on a more simplistic level, even visualizing healing light or stand out, and this doesn't matter if you're in the middle of New York City or in a farm in Iowa, or, you know, it does not matter where you are, is, is ground your feet into the earth and feel that energy from spirit, from divine coming down through your crown chakra and going into the earth as a healing to dissipate. You can visualize if there's a part of the world right now you're especially concerned about. I know for a lot of us that that's a prevalent thought is visualize healing, angelic present. And, and it's amazing as a collective when we all focus on that, how much of a difference it really does make. Well said. Now, our next one is, I can't thank you enough for the episode, Samantha, where your comments about how entities and energies can come to us as we're on our path toward the light to block us or turn us around nearly brought me to tears. I've never slept well. I took your dream class a few months ago and have been studying about how to protect myself and ground myself. Long story short, about a month ago, I got out of my habit of grounding and protecting myself before bed. I left my protection pack of crystals at my desk and went to sleep. I had an extremely lifelike chronological dream where I felt like I was working with others and was up against some very dark energy and entities. When I woke up, I sat up and could still feel the darkness. It was like I'd been tagged and I knew they could find me in the real world. I couldn't shield myself and that's when I got very scared. I called on Archangel Michael and in my angels and my angels and guides to help me and they came and I was cleansed in light. I could feel and sense slivers of darkness being pushed out by the light. At that point, I was afraid and also relieved. I selfishly asked if they could do that again to make sure I was clean, and I was told I wouldn't survive. The voice wasn't malicious. I knew it was from an angel or guide. Then from outside the group helping me came another voice that essentially said it didn't matter because I'd be dead in six months anyway. I've been trying to get this out of my head and to not focus on it. I've been so worried about manifesting my own end because of fear. Your discussion today brought me a great deal of peace with the situation. Um, I, I don't even know where to start with this, but I'm just going to say that it's, a, again, just the commonality between this and the last dream uh, question that we had or a statement that we had from our listener about demons and darkness and negativity coming through with dreams. Personally, I think, that we're tapping into that's so pervasive right now in the collective. People are afraid. There's a lot of anguish and that opens up a doorway for this darker stuff to come in when our subconscious is more receptive. Again, personal opinion. I'm, I'm not a big fan of this is the end date. I know that there are people who feel they know their end date. I think that that's out of our control. I really do. I don't think that I can say, I'm going to pass on this date at this time. And this is how it's going. Maybe some of you do that. And I'm so, so sorry. You have to carry that burden of knowing that because that changes your life exponentially. But again, Samantha, what do you think about, you know, the darkness coming in through dreams? Because this is coming up for a lot of people right now. 
Well, I do think that the dark stuff can enter our dreams, but I also think our dreams can also reveal the dark fears that are hovering inside of us that we're afraid to admit during our present day awareness, right? So we are facing a lot of dark times. I mean, we're we're staring down a possible World War III right now. No one really wants to say that or talk about it, but that's really what everyone is, uh, is afraid of. And the fact that it's turning up in our dreams, I don't think is surprising. There's a lot of fear stuff going on in the world. There's a, there's a lot of negativity going on in the world and we're bombarded by it in the news and in our own thoughts and emotions and feelings about it. But I ask you this, have you ever made a healthy, good decision for yourself when you were in fear-based mode? The answer is most likely no. And so whether this dark dream was an aspect of herself or an aspect of the dark side really is, is moot because what the dark wants, whether it's our shadow side or an actual dark side is us to stay in fear because we don't make constructive good decisions when we're in fear. And so whenever you have fearful dreams like this, I think it's so important to focus on releasing and healing, confronting, and then healing and releasing that fear. And, and maybe that's just recognizing, I, I think what puts most of us in, in fear, especially with these world events, is how little control we have over what's happening, right? I mean, sure, I can buy diapers and, and formula and clothes and, and send it to refugee centers to help people in the Ukraine. And, and that makes me feel great and, and helpful. And I'm very happy to do that. But I really don't have any control over what is happening or what is going to happen in these world events. And, and that leads many people to feel fearful. And so you have to sometimes just recognize that, you know, I don't have any control over this. What do I have control over? You know, that's when I started looking up organizations where I could donate diapers to like, okay, well, I have, I can help. That's something I have control over. That is something I can do. And, and if I think if we take those steps to focus on what we do have control over and let go of what we don't have control over, some of these negative dreams will subside. Very, very well said. Well, thank you. You're welcome. We've had a few other emails come in regarding crystal questions. One listener talked about a story of a disappearing crystal. She writes, my psychic Stephanie gave me a rose quartz from Sedona. She said it was to help promote self-love. It also is to help generate love in a new relationship. I put it in my bra during the day and under my pillow at night. Yesterday, I took off my bra and couldn't find it. I looked on the floor thinking it had dropped and I just didn't hear it. Then I remembered I had potted a plant earlier and looked outside. There it was. I never heard it fall out. A couple of hours later, I was getting ready for bed and put the phone and crystal on my desk. But when I prepared for bed, I couldn't find it. This morning, I discovered it on my desk. And then later today, it fell from my hands again. I guess this crystal's work is done. Okay, I don't know that I agree or disagree with that. I think sometimes when a crystal is bouncing away from us like that, it might just mean that this isn't the crystal for you right now. It could mean that the crystal needs to be um, cleansed or aligned with your energy. So something you could do is, uh, as we were saying before, visualize that white light coming into your head and spilling down your, your arms and out your fingers and into that crystal and really kind of commune and meditate with that crystal and ask it to do and help you to do the things you need to do to bring this new love into your life. And once we make that connection with these friends from the earth, often they will work with us much more better. Or again, like I was saying before, maybe you need to work with a green stone for your heart chakra before you jump to the pink stone, which is usually associated with the higher heart chakra. So maybe start with a green aventurine crystal first before an Amazonite and then revisit this rose quartz. Or it could mean that you need to give this crystal to someone else and you know move on. But unless you feel that you have healed this heart issue, that you have learned to love yourself and have invited this new relationship in, I wouldn't necessarily say that that crystal's work is done. What, what do you think, Denise? And it keeps coming back. It's yeah. not disappearing. It's not shattering. It's not breaking. It's not lost. So 
it, it could just be kind of a sassy crystal. <laughs> it could be. Or maybe, you know, when you say that, it makes me think maybe that crystal is trying to teach her by mimicking maybe this is how she treats loving herself, right? Like sometimes she loves herself and sometimes she just disappears from that self-love. Oh, that's an excellent way to put it. That's perfect. Uh Um, Another listener wrote, I have an important job interview coming up. What crystals can I wear or carry to help me ace this interview? Well, that's an easy one. Any crystal that's going to help you with self-confidence, I would recommend like tiger's eye or citrine or amazonite. And then any crystal that's going to help you with perfect, clear communication, like blue lace agate or blue calcite is going to be great as well. So I would either carry tiger's eye and blue lace agate or a citrine and an amazonite, but I would, I would definitely try to have a light blue crystal in there as well for that excellent communication and good luck on your interview. Yes. On another dream story, this one, lots of dreaming meals. There is lots of dreaming. In my dream, I was in a kitchen cooking with my mom, who's still alive and chatting in a very relaxed way when I felt a presence behind me. So I turned around and saw my father, who's deceased. When I saw him, I exclaimed happily with a smile, Dad, what are you doing here? You're dead. My mom in the kitchen then faded out and he replied, yes, but I'm here. To which I said, well, can I give you a hug? As I stretched out my arms, he nodded and responded and outstretched his arms in return. I hugged him and a bright white light started to glow between us and then it radiated out until we both dissolved into the bright white light that became all there is. And I had an overwhelming visceral feeling of pure love. The dream is so powerful that when I think of it, I can bring back that all encompassing feeling of pure love. Recalling the dream helps me to see my connection to others and also gives me a knowing that it'll all be okay. Also, it makes me feel as if I haven't truly lost my father at all. He's right here with me. It's a true gift to have had this white light experience, and I'm truly happy to share the story with you. That is a beautiful, beautiful example of a visitation dream. And someone had reached out to us and asked if we do a show on on visitation dreams. And I think that could be kind of fun, is, is have some people send in some stories about dreams that... And usually they're very clear, they're very vivid, there's something that it will stay with you for years and years and years, how clear and crisp and succinct those visitation dreams really are. I've always experienced them as being very positive, as very loving, as very nurturing. I've never had a dark visitation dream. I don't don't think I've ever heard of anyone that has, have you? No, I have not. That's always been very, very positive. I mean, I had that dream visit from my grandmother where she, she didn't look so great. And she said she was having a hard time with her life review process and needed our prayers. Um, So that's the only one that comes to mind, but I wouldn't really call that negative. She was just asking for our help. And then we all prayed for her. And two weeks later, I had another dream visit where she was glowing and said, thank you. And just dissolved into this light. Right. And, and that wasn't her coming with, with why didn't you do this? Or I'm so angry about that. Or, and I think that, that if there's been some unrest in your life when, and someone passes, especially if they pass unexpectedly, you may process it through your dream world with negative images or scenarios. And that's not a visitation. No. And that's a really important point to make. And I just want to add that the, power and potency of the love that this father has is amazing because in everything I have experienced and researched about dream visitation, it takes quite a long time for them to figure out how to visit us in a dream. And it takes them even longer to figure out how to hug us in a dream. And that is really comprised of the strength of their love for us and also their ability to work with their spiritual energy. Right. So like when I, when my friend George passed away, I had a dream and I saw him and I rushed to hug him. And he said, Oh, I can't do that. I haven't learned how to do that yet. Just sit with me and we'll visit a while. And then a couple of dreams later, I was able to hug him in a dream, but it it took him a while to figure that out. And so I think just the fact that her first dream about her, her father is she's able to hug him. That shows that he worked hard on that and that the strength of that father's love is truly eternal. Mm -hmm. 
That's beautiful. Yes. And I love the glowing white light and feeling a part of all that is. And you know something special is going on if you're having a dream like that. Oh, amen to that. Okay, our next question says, hello, ladies, I would really appreciate your input. I listen to your podcast and it has helped me a lot. I've always had little experiences with deceased loved ones. However, I'm starting to experience other things as well. For example, when in crowded places, I will hear whispering that will follow other people. It's like a whisper of a name or other words. I understand the whisper at the time, but cannot recall it later. Can you provide insight on this? I'm starting to feel like I'm going crazy. Okay, well, I am not clear audience, so I, I have not experienced this. I do have a friend who's very clear audience, and he will hear names. And it took him a long time. Like he had to take a lot of intuitive development classes and read a lot of books to get up his confidence. But he started asking people and he would say like, you know, please ignore this if it means nothing. But for some reason, um, I'm, I keep seeing the name Emily around you. And when he felt that it was right and okay to do that, he would get feedback like, oh, that's, that's my aunt who died this year. Or, you know, he would get feedback. And so it could be that, you are really opening up to your mediumship abilities, or it could be oftentimes I've, I've explained this on my other podcast years ago, and I feel really stupid and silly doing it again, but here goes. (laughs) Denise, do you ever experience this? If you were walking, like say you're walking down a grocery aisle, And you know, like when someone cuts in front of you, and so you kind of have to walk through the the residue of their energy. Mm -hmm. You ever pick up stuff when you do that? Yes. And I've worked really hard to shut that off. Yes, I have too. I have too. But sometimes I'll get a a download of information about that person, or I'll get like a feeling of, oh, that's a really good person, or, oh, they're very, very sad, or I need to, I need to pray that they receive a blessing today, or, or. I'll get an anchor, but I'll get like a feeling. And yeah. so um, I wonder if what she's doing as she's hearing these whispers trail these people, I wonder if she's hearing that energy, whereas I tend to feel it. W- what do you think? I think I agree. And, and I do think it's a, a form of clear audience. And back when I was teaching and we were working in a commercial kitchen, sometimes kids would be on the other side of the room and I'd hear I'd hear things like a whisper and I'd turn around and I'd speak to them about it. And I remember this one kid looked at me and he said, how did you hear that? I I didn't, I said it, I whispered it. How did you hear it? So I think it's fine tuning your senses. And sometimes with the whispers or with the sense, with any of your clairs, it's going to be exemplified at certain times. It's going to really be like you've turned the volume way up. But I think that's a huge, huge sign of clear audience to be getting that. And I don't think it's craziness at all. No, unless the whispers are always negative or telling you to do stuff you don't want to do, then you do have to see a mental health professional. Very much so. But uh, if you're just hearing names or insights about what's going on with them, that's typically clear audience. Yes. And our last one, um, emailing to ask if an experience I had was a dream or visitation. Wow, we really are having a theme to today's show. Monday mornings typically begin at 4.30. My husband has to be to work at 6, and I help our nine-year-old daughter get dressed and get ready to be dropped off at my mother-in-law's. I get them out the door, and when I get ready for work for myself, I put in my earbuds to say the rosary. All this went like clockwork until after I finished praying, I had about an hour to spare, So I decided to take a short nap. We have a disabled daughter. Sunday was a tough day for us and I had a late night. I fell asleep listening to a sleep story but woke up when it was finished and realized there were about 10 minutes to spare before the alarm sounded. I took out my earbuds and laid there thinking about the week in front of me. I started feeling at first a vibration inside me. Then I heard a frequency that came in spurts at first and then long waves. It wasn't a ringing, but sounded like a high vibration that I could also feel inside my body. I tried to open my eyes, but I found my eyelids refusing to open, except for a small slit where I could see a a light in the corner of my bedroom ceiling. The vibration started to hurt my head and my ears, so I lifted my hands to cover my ears, and I remember thinking, this hurts, make it stop. 
and all of a sudden it stopped, but I couldn't open my eyes. I heard a voice ask me, are you ready? I responded by saying, ready for what? And then I thought, this is God. You don't get to question God. So I said, yes, I'm ready. Thank you. Then he said, you know you are, and I'm going to send things your way. It won't all be easy. And I just responded by saying, okay, I trust you. I was lifted out of my body by a glowing lasso. I'm sorry, but that's the only way I can describe describe it. Like the one Wonder Woman uses, except it was glowing super bright, but it didn't hurt or burn. It was lift, I was lifted out of my body and we were connected. I was in a dark space except for God, who was a light with this lasso or, or cord connected to it. This the lasso went around me several times and I watched it get brighter and brighter. I felt like it felt like I was riding a roller coaster when I was lifted out. I started thinking, I sure hope my alarm doesn't go off and take me away from this moment. And just as quickly, I was lifted out of my body and I was back in my bed. I got up and thought, what a crazy dream. And I opened my bedroom door to go into the bathroom, but the house wasn't mine. It looked like a hotel. I walked into what I thought was my bathroom, but it was a it was a bathroom, all right, just not mine. I'd never seen this place before, but I knew where everything was. Then my alarm went off a full 30 minutes after it was supposed to go off. It felt so real. I even smelled incense when I was lifted out of my body. I was never scared at all, and I hope it happens again. I should have prefaced this by telling you I lost my faith when my daughter was first diagnosed. It wasn't quick, but a gradual ending of a truly beautiful relationship I had with God. I was so angry for the first three years of her life. She has unprovoked prolonged seizures, and I saw these daily seizures slowly taking her away from me. I prayed and prayed for her, and all I saw was regression in my child. I've written to you before through the Enlightened Empath email and explained how I felt that we made a soul contract before incarnating in this life. Because of your Psychic Teachers podcast, I opened myself up to the concept of guardian angels. A series of miraculous events brought me back to God and a renewed faith. I pray for forgiveness every day for losing my way and leaving God for those three years. I promise never to turn my back on him again. Even though my daughter still struggles with this rare disease, I'll never stop praying for a cure. I light candles to St. Jude, Archangel Michael, and Mother Mary for intervention, and these candles are always lit constantly since 2017. This is my way of praying without ceasing for my daughter. I pray that her life will be used for his purpose and whatever he brings me to do, I'll do it. The request has brought me to some circumstances that I can only describe as true blessings, good and bad, and to meet some amazing people. I'm an introvert and being seen by the public is so cringy, let alone telling the saddest part story of your life. How would you feel if cameras were pointed at you while you told the story of the saddest thing that has ever happened to you? So I just don't watch myself. My daughter and I are featured on a YouTube channel or even the banner for the page. I just finished filming a series of videos with an actor about caring for caregivers. Don't get me wrong. This life is effing hard despite the blessings. Living life with unpredictable seizures means there's almost no life. No going out, no parties, with almost everything being a trigger, it really limits what my family can do. But at the same time, we're doing things other people only dream about. So with all that said, can you help me figure out if this is a dream or a visitation? I can't talk to my friends about it. They'll think I'm nuts. I told my husband right away, and he believes it's a visitation. I've had many amazing experiences with my angel, and he knows everything and is very supportive. How else can I interpret this? Bigger question, how can I have more experiences like this? I loved it. Am I wrong to hope he means my daughter will be cured and free from this disease? This is really all I ever wanted. That's a lot. I'm speechless. Yeah, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed. It, it's a lot. It's, uh, it's vivid. It's surreal. It's deep. It's, it, it exemplifies this person's connection, this woman's connection with her spiritual religious beliefs that it brought her back to her faith, that your your podcast episode on, on psychic teachers helped her to regain her faith is a beautiful, beautiful part of this. I do think, again, just to go to the science to it of if our subconscious is more open to things that we may not be willing to experience when we're in a sleep state 
in a dream state that we may not be able or willing to open to in our waking cognitive state. So do I think it was a visitation? Yes. Do I think that it was so vivid and detailed and empowering for this person? Very much so. I wish I had a magic elixir to say, you know, do this and you'll have these more, you'll have more dreams like this for myself. I find that those really intense connected dreams are few and far between. They're rare, but when they come, they do make you want more. What do you think? Well, I think some of the examples in her story prove it's not a dream. First of all, she wasn't sleeping. She remembers pulling her earbuds out and just sitting there thinking about the week ahead. She knew the alarm was going to go off in 10 minutes, and yet it was 30 full minutes before the alarm went off. I mean, how, how do you explain that? She was lifted up out of her body. And if you research astral projection, if you astrally project from your body, whether it's spontaneous or on purpose through meditation, the one thing that will bring you back to your body instantly is thinking about your body. And if you read in her story, she says the minute she thought about like, oh, I'm having this out of body, she was back in her body. So to me, those, all those little examples prove that this was an experience and not, not a dream. And I think that the lasso image is, you know, God's way of saying I'm lassoed in love, you know, like we're, we're lassoed in love together and we are going to help so many people who are going through the same pain that you're going. And so he's calling her to do these videos, to put her story out there publicly. And he's saying, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard, but I need you to do this. And I know you'll do this for me and with me. And so I think it's just confirmation that everything does have a purpose. You know, on, on Psychic Teachers, we recently interviewed Gary Lockman, and he shared little bits and pieces of a very compelling dream experience he had with the famous spiritual teacher, Rudolf Steiner, where he said to Gary, he pointed out to Gary all the, all the pain in the world and all the beauty. And he said, when you get to this enlightened stage, you can see all the beauty and purpose and rhyme and reason behind the painful things on earth. And I, I've always would like to believe that, you know, I mean, it's hard to see them, to witness them, to go through them, but I always like to believe that there has to be a, a, some type of purpose behind it. And I feel like this is what that dream visit, which I really shouldn't call a dream visit, this astral projected experience she had with her creator was demonstrating that even though it's so painful to have to, you know, really watch your child suffer in these ways, that God is using this to help others. And he's using, I think he's even using her loss of faith and her, her um, coming back to faith as an example to help inspire other people as well. Because other than being that disabled child, I think the only thing harder or as hard as being the parent of that child, you know, because you always want the best for your child. Of course, you always want the best. Do I believe that a miracle can happen? Yes, I do. There's a famous story. It was highlighted on Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, Brian Gumbel did a story on it on, in the 80s on a show on miracles of a woman who was um, bed bound or wheelchair bound with MS. And she kept praying to mother Mary every day. And after, gosh, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years, she just heard Mary say, get up and walk. And she got up and walked and, and you can, you can see on the video, uh, her kids took it of her waiting at the end of this, the driveway for her husband to come home because he had not seen her standing up in so many years. It's just a beautiful story. So there, there are stories of miracles that occur like this. And so I'm a, I'm a firm believer in miracles, but I also am a firm believer in the average ordinary everyday miracle. Do you know what I mean? Like to me, there's almost something more beautiful in the way she and her daughter are teaching the world to, to really survive and thrive through these difficulties. I mean, to me, that's just, that's just a beautiful thing. It, it is. And if you believe that we come here with, to learn life lessons with, with contracts, with what an incredibly powerful contract she and her daughter came in and the YouTube channel and what they're 
and sharing that sadness is also empowering and being of service to so many people who are, are getting a sense of hope from both of them. I mean, that's, yeah. And if, if she wants to repeat this experience, I, first of all, I think it's really hard to repeat a miraculous experience. And this to me seems like a miraculous experience. But if, if she did study astral projection, and there are some great books out there, I would recommend Sullivan Muldoon's or Oliver Fox's, both were written at the, the turn of the um, 20th century. So they're, they're old books, but they're wonderful books on astral projection and how to engage it. But there are some great teachers who are, who are also actively teaching you how to do this. That might also help you have this experience again. But uh, we thank you for taking the time to share this. And we especially thank you for the amazing work you are doing, not only for your daughter, but also for all the caregivers out there who are struggling and, and looking for that lasso, that lifeline to keep them caring and, and moving on through these difficult times. Yes, I agree a hundred percent. Please know you're in our thoughts and prayers. Well, thank you guys, everybody for sending in your stories, your dreams, and your questions. We always love hearing from you. If you want to share something with us, you can email us enlightenedempaths at gmail, or you can message us on our Facebook page. You can find us there by searching enlightened empaths. And please don't forget to check out our individual websites. Mine is samanthafay.com and Denise's is thegratefulmessenger.com. We hope you have a beautiful week filled with your own dream visitations and miraculous stories. Please remember, as always, to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care.